Do Qatar. I'm Kate Fortune, President of the Friends of the Turnbull Library. A very warm welcome to you all. It's great to see you here. This public talk is in association with the Randall Cottage Writers Trust and the publishers, Marco Press, and we're here to find out more about Minnie Dean, the only woman to be hanged for murder in New Zealand. Now, first, the safety information. In the event of emergency, we all know we stay calm and we follow the instructions of bookshop staff who would tell us probably to exit this way, but we will wait to be told. And if you do need toilets, it's out that way on this floor, um, just across there and towards the right. And can I please remind you all to turn off or silence your mobile phones. Thank you. Today's event really for the Friends of Turnbull Library launches our centenary year. On June 28th, we're celebrating the actual anniversary, 100 years since the Alexander Turnbull Library first opened to the public in New Zealand. It's going to be a terrific year for us, and if you're not yet a member, come and see me afterwards. We'd love you to join. There's going to be a lot happening in the year to come. Thank you all, and now I hand you over to Mary McCallum, who's going to chair this panel discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's a bit of a surprise, to be honest. We thought it wouldn't be happening. Uh, but Kate's determined <laughs> and <laughs> decided it would, even though, really, we're so barely out of lockdown that it feels almost still a bit strange, doesn't it, to be gathering like this and so closely. But um, we've got, each got separate microphones. We're quite relieved about that. Um, who knows? But thank you all for coming. This is wonderful. We didn't expect such crowds, so well done. I hope you're comfortable standing. Um, you could sort of flop down on the ground still here, I guess. Um, so yes, welcome to, most of all, to our two authors, Amori da Cunha, uh, the French writer who's been at the um, Randall Cottage, which is not far away, just up the road in Thorndon, for six months or... Five months. Five months, five months. Can you hear me okay at the back? For five months. He's also a photographer, um, and yes, he's been writer in residence there, um, writing, I guess, and you said lockdown's been pretty good for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Christchurch author and retired psychotherapist and psychiatrist Karen Zellis, who's flown to Wellington especially for this. Uh, departure for her given she's been locked down and very careful about that. In fact, she wasn't sure at first, but then she thought, yep, she'd give it a go. So I picked her up from the airport today, looking a little bit empty there in the car park, wasn't it? But um, not many people flying still. So lovely to have you here, Karen. Lovely to have you here, Amori, um, both in Wellington, both at Vic Books. Thank you, Vic Books, for having us so enthusiastically fairly last minute. Um, thank you to the, you're obviously Kate Fortune and the Friends of Turnbull Library. Ngā hoa e o te whare puka puka Turnbull, I like that. The Randall Cottage Writers Trust, which I don't think has a Māori name yet. Where are you guys? Thinking of one? Is there one, Shan? Is there one? No, soon, one day. Um, <laughs> And Vic Books, obviously, yes, thank you for having us here. So I hope it all goes well. We have some books for sale at the end, Karen's book. Amori's book has not yet been published, but watch this space, because that will be happening at some point very soon. Okay, so both these authors live at opposite ends of the earth, um, but they have a shared fascination with one woman, Minnie Dean. Uh, the infamous baby farmer from Southland. Now, some of you know of her, or have just, uh, have, who has just heard of her knowing about this event? Well, most of you are quite knowledgeable. Oh, interesting. <gasps> There's one, okay, good, good admission. <laughs> okay, so she lived in Southland, um, and she cared for unwanted babies in the 1880s, some of whom died. We'll discuss why soon. Um, she was charged, however, and convicted for the death of one, wasn't it, Karen? Yes. Um, and then she was hanged, the only woman to be hanged in New Zealand, and that was in 1895. Um, so, Amori, you've been working on a book about her while you've been here. That's spent much of your time writing this or researching it and travelling. 
Um, and three years ago, I, as a publisher, published um, Karen's first biography called The Trials of Minnie Dean, um, a work that uses various voices and has quite an interesting format because the voices come at you from all angles on page, including upside down and small and large and all sorts. But she's trying to bring together the voices of the various participants in that, what happened back then for Minnie, and I guess the community voices as well. Um, also in the audience today we have, um, oh sorry, I should say Karen is developing that story into a one woman play as well, so there's, it's in development. We also have Janice Gill in the audience, just here in the front row, and she's a Nelson artist who has painted Minnie Dean and the various scenes from Minnie's life and published a book five, six years ago. Yep. Yes, my, um, book of my own paintings, the, yeah, tellings. the paintings of Minnie Dean are in there, um, so that's from a number of years ago, but she he is here because she travelled with Amori down south to take him to the sites of the life, show him the life, I guess the area where Minnie lived. And we also have Sean Robbins here from Randall Cottage who's going to read for Amori because he's not very happy reading in English. I don't know why because his English sounds perfectly fine to me. But apparently Sean reads better than him so she's going to do his reading. Okay, well we'll start with um, Karen. So we just you know, warm things up, I guess. Karen, if you could tell us what drew you to Minnie Dean. Have you got your microphone ready? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, in a, in a former life, I was a psychiatrist and... Can you hear her at the back? I think you need to no. talk a bit louder. Or keep Just the mic close to your mouth. It's definitely on. It, it is. Uh, that's better, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, in a former life, I was a psychiatrist uh, and I worked with children and families and had a specialist interest in uh, child abuse and neglect. Um, and I came across Minnie Dean in that context um, and was interested in her and the events of the time, really, that contributed, I think, to how she is still seen today. Um, and, uh, and then s since my retirement, uh, I've been writing, and I was looking for an iconic piece of New Zealand history that I wanted to write a, um, a verse biography about um, something that was, so I took this story and imagined the um, perspectives from many people in different places and different parts and I think later there'll be the opportunity to read one or two to you. Um, so that these pieces would fit together, these voices would fit together like pieces of a jigsaw that um, pe people could then read and assemble in their own minds and come to their own conclusions about whether they felt she was but a what, murderer what or not. what drew you to her? I mean, you know, what this little woman, well, this one case down in the south. Okay. Um, well, the more I looked into it, the, the more I was drawn to her as a person. I mean, I think in some ways she was her own worst enemy. She was, I think, a rather cantankerous lady, probably. Um, but also one who clearly was very concerned about the well-being of young children and children that nobody else wanted. Um, and yes, some children did die in her care. But the infant mortality rate and the death rate in early childhood were incredibly high at, those, at that time. And the in, only institutional care that they had for young children, um, the death rate for infants and newborns was up to 90 plus percent. Uh, so, you know, she and a few other people like her were actually providing um, a public service but were tarred really with the deaths of these children uh, and scapegoated, I think, really by the society who wanted 
illegitimate children not to have happened, not to be seen, not to be heard. Um, and the focus then becomes upon the carer rather than the community having to feel, well, this is our problem. Um, and so it's a very, uh, a very intensely, oh, I, I feel quite impassioned about it, really. Mm. Uh, so as you, as you researched, I mean, did you start off uh, trying, you know, open-minded, I guess, about her? She was called a villain. I mean, she was hung, hanged for her crime. Um, yes. So you went into it thinking, well, let's see what the true story is. Well, my first actual exposure to what you would call um, research, really, was I was asked to um, write a book review for Lindley Hood's biography of her. And I found that that lays out in a very um, sensible way, as I have tried to as well, all the, all the known information without saying, and this is the conclusion. And so that the reader can look at all of that information themselves and make their decision about whether they think she got what she deserved or whether in fact she was vilified. Excuse me, just a question. Uh, do you remember the first time you heard about her, Minnie Dean? I didn't know about her before I... Discovering the book from Lily? before I got that book. Okay. Yeah. I know a lot of people do, and, and I think the further south in New Zealand you go, <laughs> the more um, people know about her. And it's, it's amazing, really, I think, the way the, and the extent to which she is still um, just regarded as a murderer, and you rather do want to talk about it. What about you? I was going to ask Karen some more questions before getting to you. I think it's been great to hear from you now, Amori. What drew you to this woman, Minnie Dean? That's a good question. Uh, I was looking for something because I, I, I was preparing the, the, the application for the Randall Cottage. And, uh, and for me, New Zealand, from my country, was uh, uh, maybe a country of dreams, etc. But I was. I've always been interested in the in the, the beauty, but the beauty hides sometimes shadows. And uh, I was just wondering, in this country, which in France we always you know, see it like a sort of paradise, very far away. And I'm always interested in in uh, in accidents, in uh, something that that is wrong, etc. So I was looking for a lot of story from the past, and uh, and suddenly on the terrifying blog, uh, absolutely not good, but uh, uh, I don't murder, murder a mouse, uh, sort of rubbish thing like that. I found this story and I was, I found it very, very interesting. And, and in the beginning, I was looking for everything that was written on her. And, I, and uh, when I began to look for Mini, uh, I realized that there was a fantastic biography, there were a poetry book, there were also a song written by two songs, uh, one recent written by Marlon Williams, and I, I was wondering why why all those people are fascinating by this woman, and uh, that's the reason why I wanted to to understand uh, not to write a biography because it's already done, but I wanted to uh, to come here uh, and to use in in a certain way a minute in to meet people. Who, to, uh, to try to understand this, uh, this iconic piece, as you say. Mm -hmm. So when you started to uh, find out about her, you, you found, I mean, it's quite a particular time and place and the, the way people were then, all of that, that you would have to research before you even got to understand many, wouldn't it? I mean, this is the Southland in New Zealand, Yes, Deep South, everything um, for me from Paris was very far and very, <laughs> very strange. And but uh, it's fantastic because uh, when you are in Paris uh, with internet, you can uh, you can uh, look looking for a lot of things uh, virtually. Mm. Uh, so uh, my trip began before arriving here uh, by uh, by writing to people, by looking for uh, things on. Uh, uh, I don't remember the name of this fantastic website, uh, past... Uh, oh, Papers Past. Yes, uh, Papers it's past. extraordinary. We don't have this uh, equivalent in France. But, uh, oh, nice. So I rem 
I discovered that there were, there were a lot of things available for my research <coughs> before arriving here. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really began to work before arriving here. Mm -hmm. I was living with this story since uh, August uh, from last year, you know. Yeah. And I arrived in January. So K Karen's written hers as a verse novel. Uh, verse novella, I guess, you know, it's um, quite unusual in, on the page, the way the voices are and all of that. What did you think when you read it? Um, I, I heard about your book when I was in Paris, but I, I couldn't get it because it's quite, it's not very easy from Paris to get the, this book from your... It's not easy in New Zealand. <laughs> yeah. but so so um, we, uh, we had a little discussion on, on mm. by mail. And when I arrived here, uh, the fantastic people from the Rundle Cottage has uh, uh, offered me the book. So I began to write, to read it when I arrived, uh, when I arrived it here. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry, my English sometimes is quite is quite poor. It's not always easy to to be understood. And I hope it's, no, you're, it's not you're the really, case. really clear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, and fa I found this book very interesting because it was not a biography. It was uh, you. We are uh, you were using uh, minidin like uh, poetic material, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and then I was just without. And you were very uh, very close to the truth also because you you are not making a sort of uh, phantasma uh, uh, on her. Uh, and I found this uh, way of uh, talking uh, about this very very interesting. As I written it to you, I think mm -hmm. it was a sort of polyphonic way of. Uh, uh, telling this story because sometimes we hear the voices from from the press, the voice from Minidin, uh, the voice from uh, the the lawyer, the lawyer, etc. Et so yeah, the policeman and the policeman, etc. Yeah. So it's, the judge. It's it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, of game of uh, words and uh, or talks that that you manage to combine in this little book. So what do you? Um what will you do um, with your material? You're a more non-fiction writer, uh, so yes. you're going to be writing about it in that way? Yes, I think, uh, uh, it's not I think because I began to write, so I know a little bit what, I, what, I've, what I've done from, because I've written nine chapters. I'm very happy, with, thanks to lockdown. <laughs> and uh, no, it was important for me to, 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 to tell there is a there will be a biography uh, dominance in this book, but it's always from my point of view because uh, I cannot be uh, uh, out of this story because I, and, and the, the biography exists. I don't have to do it, you know, uh, in English. So I wanted to always to to keep my existential situation to this story. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a sort always a combination between what I feel and what happened, mm. what's mm. happened in this mm. way. Mm. Just, could you, can you hear okay at the back? Because when you pushed it a bit more directly, I ah, think. Ah, sorry. Right, yeah. The, it's better like this? The deep mm. sounds of the microphone at work. Yes, that's very, so you, it'll be you uh, researching, traveling, looking at New Zealand, yes. looking at Mini, and bringing that together. Yes, it's it's an experience of meeting people also uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Mini. Mm. I think it was it's very important for me. And, uh, and as you say, as an iconic, uh, like a myth, yeah. uh, it makes me it made me think a lot of things from my own story. Maybe also I wanted to uh, to, to try to understand why I, I am interested in this. Uh, I haven't been buried in when I was a child, mm. of course, but uh, there was some, maybe some connection. I don't know. Is that I want I wanted to to try to to uh, to understand why. It, this story touches me mm -hmm. in maybe sometimes in an amb ambivalent way because mm -hmm. we're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about the the, the fact if she's guilty or not, but uh, mm -hmm. it's a real question. Of course, yeah, we do have, we to don't have the, the, the question actually. That's true, villain or victim. So I guess we we'll come back to you, Karen. You were talking earlier about the way uh, Minnie looked after unwanted children. Um, she was doing that in the 1890s to earn herself some money because she had a husband who canned out a bit as a farmer, um, in yeah. a big way, actually, and so she needed to bring money in, so she looked after children. So do, do just give us a little bit of an understanding about these were unwanted children, they were illegitimate, sometimes from wealthy families, is that right? Yes, I mean, mostly they would have been probably un unwed young women, but not entirely, because some people actually 
had as many children as they felt they could possibly care for, and they still were having children. Um, and so they came from all walks of life and from different parts of the country up and down. Um, so, uh, and she would hop on the train and go and pick up babies from places and bring mm. them back. And it was in that context that um, two children died at the end, towards the end of her life. Um, but it, she's, I think we are, we get an insight into her that you wouldn't ordinarily get for a working class woman in New Zealand at that time. Um, because while she was in prison before she died, she wrote, wanted to write out her own version of events because her voice had not been able to be heard in court. Um, and she had a different perspective and she felt very strongly that if only she had been allowed to put her point of view and tell it which is not necessarily so, but she believed that the outcome would be different if she'd been able to tell her point of view. Um, so we have written 50 odd pages of handwriting of hers in which you get a sense wait, of what- It's 53 pages, I'm already telling me. Oh, well, Sorry, only he corrected me. Near enough to 50. <laughs> <laughs> I said 50 Round the muffle down. <laughs> But anyway, she, um, yeah, we were able to get a sense even of phrases that she used and what her approach and attitude was, which is not to say all of it is uh, positive and uh, in her best interests in, <laughs> in some respects. Yeah. But um, yeah, and that's a very unusual starting point if you're wanting to reconstruct something from did, a previous did she, did she have a sense that does she express this in her writing that um, a feeling that she was being judged because she was looking after these unwanted children, these illegitimate children, and um, oh, yes. therefore she, society frowned on the children and therefore frowned on her? Yes, yeah. absolutely, that she was being scapegoated and that they were just looking and hounding her to find something that they could find wrong. And, uh, um, and they were constantly checking on her and coming and visiting and accusing her and not being satisfied with coroner's reports when when a child died of something that was, you know, a respiratory infection or something like that, clearly. Um, Who were they? Yeah. You said they were. The police? The, the, the police, police school yeah, was the, checking on her, yeah, yeah. regularly. And, yeah. and yes, I guess, yes, hounding her. But there were bodies found in her garden. I, yeah, you know. there, were, there were bodies of two infants that died on the train and one older child who's never been identified, his identity hasn't been identified for certain. Um, but interestingly, she was only charged with the, the killing of one of those infants. Um, and I have to say that I am quite certain that if she came to court in the 21st century, on the basis of the information that they had, the evidence that they had, she would not be convicted today. Mm. But it doesn't mean she didn't do it. Mm. But the, it, the level of certainty um, is just not there. But when you say it doesn't mean she didn't do it, the way you write her character in the book is of an, someone innocent. You know, she, she that she was just a, a victim of her times, really, mm. with these um, children that weren't well fed, often, you yeah. know, barely able, you know, had, some of them hadn't even drunk. They, they well, the, the second younger child who actually died on the train, she was given to her in a state of neglect. Yeah. And she died within an hour of Minnie Dean taking her from the grandmother. Um, so, you know, it's maybe this is why she, they didn't feel that they could necessarily get a conviction if they, mm. if they um, made that case. Um, and the child who, the other child who died, who was a little older, um, she was, um, 
She was found by the pathologist to have, and the coroner, to have died of an overdose of laudanum. Um, but at the same time, they said that the laudanum prescription that she had got from the chemist to calm this child down, um, and it was common practice to use laudanum with children in those days, um, was a much stronger dose of linctus than she was used to having. And so, you know, and she insists that it was an accidental overdose and that she had suffered terribly herself from having committed this um, accident, be re been responsible for this accident. So, I mean, to me it sounds, and certainly reading your book, you feel that, yes, she was um, harshly judged um, by the community, but also yeah. the, um, in terms of the, as you say, the lack of evidence around her, yeah. um, around the, the deaths of those children, just says yeah. that she was probably innocent. And that's what you seem to think, yeah. But my, that, I mean, you, you're, you're putting the words into my mouth, in a sense, because um, <laughs> I don't know whether she's guilty oh, okay. or innocent. I mean, no one at this stage can know that, just I certain. Have, I have a, just a question. Yeah. Um, when we, when you, we are interested in, in this story, and when you, we read uh, Minidin's last statement, for example, we, we feel that something is wrong in our mind. Mm -hmm. There's something really confused. She's always lying, or she's, she lies a lot. Uh, as a psychiatrist, how do, would you, what would you say uh, of her behavior? <laughs> Because you didn't, you didn't forget that you were also a psychiatrist when you, when you have written this book, surely. That, 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 no, I didn't. In fact, I, <laughs> I put myself in there saying some of these no. things. But um, I take it that her reputation and how people thought about her was extremely important to her and to her sense of well-being and her sense of herself. And... Um, so I think a lot of the lies that she told and some of the um, comments that she makes in her written statement support the idea that they were, they were lies to um, make her look better. And to protect herself. And to protect uh, herself, herself and her and reputation and, and herself. Also, yeah. And the parents of the baby. So oh, that's right. She, she didn't couldn't. relieve the, the identity of the lost, lost, uh, lost children. She, speak speak she, in closer. So. She didn't reveal the no, no. identity of the, no. the lost children because they, people have to know that there were also other babies that had disappeared in the cottage uh, during yeah. all those years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean there was no system of, of registering mm. and knowing who, where children were and who was looking mm. after them and that sort of thing. Um, but she, she did clearly treat it as being a confidential process and when she took other people's children um, and she would not reveal the names of the parents even though the police wanted her to do so. Um, so she was a complicated person, I think. And actually even, you know, some of those people weren't actually paying her for what she was doing, were they? Or they no. said they would and they she, didn't. Well, she, took, and she even had to take some of them to court and the judge would rule, yes, they had to pay, and then they just didn't. And uh, do you think uh, her behaviour or what, what she did is, might be the consequences of what happened to her daughter? Because of people... Uh, uh, I think it's one of these. Could you tell uh, mm. precisely right. to, to I mean, people I, what okay. happened with Ellen? Because yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, you'd be better than me. Yeah, I mean, her, um, her severe losses started in childhood with her mother's cancer for over a prolonged period and then dying while she was uh, still a, uh, a girl in her early teens. Well, and um, that, that was, I think, a, a the first, uh, the first trauma. major trauma, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then in um, 1984... Um, 1884. Eight, sorry, 1884. <laughs> um, 
her daughter clearly had a severe psychotic depressive breakdown and drowned herself and her two infants in the well on, on the, the farm that she and her husband, that the daughter and her husband lived on. Um, and I think that, again, was, um, and, a, and a, a less stressful but important factor too, um, before that, was that uh, she couldn't, she had these two daughters when she was in her late teens, and then she couldn't have children with her husband. So there were no more babies for her to look after. And she had, you know, half brought up three younger sisters in Scotland. Um, and she felt that, you know, this is what she was good at and this is what she wanted to do and needed to do, and she wasn't able to. Um, so all of these things compounded, I think, um, uh, and uh, contributed in various ways. And yeah, made her, I guess, feel that she was disturbed, is what you're saying, particularly at the end of her life, but also, I mean, added the stress of knowing she was going to be hanged, kind of. Well, exactly. I mean, she wrote, she wrote this declaration mm -hmm. while she was awaiting sen um, sentence, and, um, yeah, it's not surprising that uh, she felt vindictive mm. against the people who she felt had let her down. And uh, but there's also evidence of people letting her letting her down at an earlier stage and withholding payment and not helping her when yeah. she was in need and, and things like that. Yeah, she's a woman with her back against the wall, wasn't <laughs> Absolutely. she? Absolutely. Not much money. She had to find the money herself, mm -hmm. and it was difficult looking after these babies. I mean, she may have been negligent at times, perhaps, because sometimes she had like nine babies in there, uh, you know. Um, she also had um, one, two, two older girls specifically to help her with them. One was Margaret Cameron, whom she had adopted earlier, and, um, and then one she adopted specifically for that purpose, uh, who was 10 when she came and was still there when uh, the police came and take, took uh, many away. Mm. Interesting. Mm. I wonder if you might read a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Would you like to do that from the, the lectern? You need your microphone with you. Oh, yeah, no, that's a, no, no, that's a light. And then we'll do your reading up. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, earmarked and I'm not quite sure how much time. Oh, no, no, no. I've got, yeah, no. Um, the poems that I have earmarked have sort of relate actually to some of the things that we've been talking about. So I wanted to give you so, uh, a few different voices from different perspectives. So this is a poem in Minnie's voice I care for bands. It's what women do. Why God gave us two arms, one to hold a child a hip, t'other to stir the pot. I am a good woman like my ma, good my what sorry, good mother, wife. When she left I wore her shoes until they were down at heel and I ready for the dung heap. Today I cannot resist a child in need, despairing the reluctant fruit of my womb. To fill the empty place, adopted May Irene, newborn. The doctor said she would not live, but I cherished her, and against the odds, she did. If there were none like me to save and cause it, the world would be a crueler place. Each child brings a story, at the right moment, even respectability, a little embroidery, and That's, that's the end of the poem. That is poem. the end of the poem. <laughs> yeah. And one other in her voice. Where would they be without me? These uppity girls and parents. I sweep their mistakes like dust beneath the rug. 
so they may dance upon it in white linens. I ask a pittance, and am reviled. Where would they be without me? Helpless bands, unwanted through no fault of theirs. I cherish each we soul as means allow. Fetch the doctor, educate. Where would they be without me? Were they from my own womb, I could not love them more. And I'll read a couple of short poems in the voice of the policeman who kept on harassing her time after time. Constable Hans Peter Rasmussen, number five. No matter, oh, this, this poem um, follows an inquest for a child who died um, of a respiratory disorder. No matter that I cupped my hand again like river sand, she slipped between my fingers. The inquest found her faultless this time, but I know better. She's killing children by exposure. The doctor thinks May Irene Dean and John Clark will not survive. I will get evidence. And this is how he tries to do so. Under cover of darkness on 29 April 1893, Madden, another policeman, and I crept to the Dean house at the Larches. Lamplight spilt from casement windows, air a choke with wood smoke. In the sight stillness, a soul more poor bleak harbinger bearing omen. We did not announce our presence, concealed in shadow and stealth, took positions, chill mud filled our boots, making even the crowded timber shack inviting. For three long hours we waited, stiff with cold, shadows moving against the glass, a fading tapestry of voices, 11 p.m. Not one child put to sleep outdoors. We checked the outbuildings just in case and then withdrew. But I am not convinced. She can't evade my diligence indefinitely. I have two poems here, Just but the time one of them I will not read, but they are related. They're about a home for fallen women in Dunedin, where illegitimate children were being born. The second one is called Song of a Foundling, and it is an echoed response to the first one, which is about the mothers and the act of um, having them. Song of a Foundling. Oh, I was born in Dunedin Town, in the home for fallen women. I never knew my mother's sound, nor felt the warmth of her skin. I was her shame, abandoned there, in the home for fallen women. Naught but a baby farmer's care, the myth of a family gone. The myth of family gone. The myth of family gone. Gone. Nice. I think it's amazing the way that opens the story up when you can see inside the skin of the people at the time and the book's packed with that. I think it's marvellous. Um, okay, Amori, you're not going to read Shana's, is that right? Okay. Oh. oh, no, no, no. Oh, we'd love yes, to hear the please. French. Ah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ah, okay, but, but I, I, don't, I don't have the text uh, with me. <laughs> we have a lot of French speakers in the audience, so we'll be hearing a little in French. For those of you who don't speak French, I have a little bit of schoolgirl French, but if you don't speak it, just enjoy the sound. Enjoy the sound. Come up here, though. You have to be informal. It's very solemn. Oh, very, yeah, yeah. I think you'll enjoy it up there. 
uh, it's very strange because the book uh, doesn't exist for the moment and it's uh, <laughs> just an excerpt. I will thank uh, later Jen Anderson and Yulashen because she accepted to translate this in English, but well, I'm going to read in French now first. Je préférais pour l'heure me concentrer sur la photo de Minidine collée à la fenêtre de mon appartement parisien. La lumière de l'extérieur débouchait ses zones d'ombre, adoucissait un peu les traits de son visage. J'essayais d'oublier ce que je connaissais d'elle en retirant les épines de l'image, ce qui n'avait pas encore eu lieu, le drame des enfants et sa condamnation à mort. Je vis alors une inconnue en dimanche, un peu triste, qui s'est peut-être rendue chez le photographe pour faire plaisir à son mari qu'elle vient d'épouser. Ce jour-là, il faisait froid. L'hiver, dans le sud, ralentit le rythme cardiaque, chante Marlon Williams. La séance photo lui a semblé durer une éternité. Maintenant, à ma fenêtre, 123 ans après sa mort, Minidine me regardait, inquiète de ce que j'aimais bien pouvoir faire d'elle. Devant ce portrait, rendu visible par la lumière du jour, Mini et moi nous réveillons en même temps, je repensais à un texte de Roland Barthes sur la photographie d'un condamné à mort, accusé d'avoir assassiné, d'avoir voulu assassiner un secrétaire d'État américain. Cette image, reproduite dans la chambre claire, fut prise en 1865, plusieurs années avant celle de Minidine. Ces deux portraits se rencontraient. L'homme s'appelle Lewis Payne. Il pose dans sa cellule, visage blafard, regard interrogateur. Il sera bientôt pendu, comme elle. Bart trouve ce cliché aussi beau que terrifiant. « La photographie me dit la mort au futur », écrivait-il. Contrairement à l'américain, Minnie n'est pas encore arrêtée, ni condamnée. Mais elle va aussi mourir, de la même manière que lui. Elle l'ignore, mais moi, je sais déjà tout. Dans 23 ans, elle sera jugée pour le meurtre de Dorothy Edith Carter, le lundi 12 août 1895. Un matin d'hiver, elle sera pendue dans la cour de la prison d'Hilver Cargill. Si j'avais si pu... So, sorry. Si je n'avais pas pu trouver de photos ou de dessins de son exécution, grâce au témoignage d'un journaliste paru dans le Omaru Maigle du 13 août 1895, je sus à quoi ressemblait Minidine ce jour-là. Quand je me suis retrouvé à ses côtés, je fus frappé par son extrême droiture. Sa tête était haute et découverte. Ses cheveux fins gris, joliment brossés, étaient attachés en arrière. Elle portait un chemisier marron foncé, une jupe de laine à carreaux de couleur sombre. Cette description me renvoya à nouveau à la photographie de 1872. Elle cadrait parfaitement avec l'autre mini, la femme d'avant les crimes. Même raideur, même vêtement, même impassibilité. Roland Barthes dit quelque part que la photographie est un agent de la mort. On parle en effet de l'exécution d'un portrait comme celle d'un condamné à mort. Dans le studio d'Inver Cargill, Minnie a l'air pétrifiée. Elle obéit sans doute aux injonctions du photographe. Sur l'échafaud, grâce à ce journaliste, j'appris qu'elle s'était adressée à son bourreau, laconiquement. « Bourreau, fais ton devoir. » Même résignation devant l'image ou la mort, pour moi. Pas de doute, elle était déjà au travail dans cette photographie de 1872. Je décidais cependant de tempérer mon excitation. Aussi puissante et fascinante que soit une image, celle-ci m'a paru tout à coup infiniment triste. Elle n'est pas une boule de cristal. Thank you. And thank you, Jim. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that's nice. That's good? Okay. Um, this translation of the third chapter from the third chapter? Yes. From your book? And except from the third yes. chapter. Is by Jean Anderson, Associate Professor of French at Victoria University. And I think leading light of literary, Cl literary <laughs> translation in New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. okay, so close enough? That sounds okay? Mm. Right. In the meantime, I preferred to focus on the photo of Minnie Dean taped to the window of my apartment in Paris. The light from outside brightened its shadows, slightly softening her features. I tried to forget what I knew about her, seeing the image minus the, its dark side, 
as had yet to happen, the whole drama of the children and her death sentence. What I saw then was an unknown, somewhat sad-looking woman in all the finery, who had probably come to the photographers to please her newlywed husband. It was cold that day. Winter in the south makes the heart beat slow, sings Marlon Williams. The photo session seemed to drag on forever. Now, 123 years later, Minnie Dean was watching me, worrying about what I might make of her. Faced with this portrait taking shape in the sunlight, Minnie and I were emerging from the night together, I remembered what Roland Barthes wrote about the photo of a condemned man accused of trying to assassinate an American Secretary of State. The photograph, reproduced in Camera Lucida, was taken in 1865, a few years before Minnie Dean's, but the two portraits were similar. The man's name is Louis Payne. He is posing in his cell, his face pale, his expression questioning. He is to be hanged soon, like her. Bart finds this image as beautiful as it is terrifying. The photograph tells me death is in the future, he wrote. Unlike the American, Minnie Dean has not yet been arrested or condemned, but she's going to die too, in the same way he is. She doesn't know this, but I know all of it already. In 23 years, she will be judged for the murder of Dorothy Edith Carter. And on a cold winter's morning, on Monday the 12th of August, 1895, she will be hanged in the courtyard of Invercargill Prison. Although I hadn't been able to find a photograph or any drawings of her execution, I did know what she looked like that day, thanks to a journalist's account in the Oamaru Mail, dated the 13th of August, 1895. At the first glance I got of her, I was struck with her dignified carriage and bearing, head erect, uncovered of course, thin, fine, iron grey hair, nicely brushed and parted in the middle and fastened in a knot behind. A dark shaded maroon blouse, a skirt of warm coloured, darker check woolen material completed her attire. This description sent me back to the 1872 photograph. It fitted the other many perfectly. The woman before the crimes, the same stiffness, the same clothes, the same impassive expression. Roland Barthes says somewhere that the photographer is an agent of death. In fact, we talk about taking a photograph the same way we talk about taking a life. In the Invercargill studio, Minnie looks petrified. She's probably following the photographer's instructions. On the gallows, I know from the same journalist, that she spoke briefly to her executioner. Executioner, do your duty. The same resignation in the face of the photograph, in the face of death. For me, there's no doubt it was already at work when this picture, picture was taken in 1872. But I decided to moderate my excitement. However powerful and fascinating an image might be, and this one suddenly struck me as infinitely sad, it's not a crystal ball. Thank you. Thank you. Sean and I have been in the same bubble briefly Thank in you. the last few weeks, so we can share a microphone easily. Of course, we don't use that language now. Of course not. No more bubbles. But now, I'm already, we've had got a lot more time left, so we need to hear about your trip into Southland. I'm yes, fascinated. Uh, um, um, you were taken there by Janice in yes, the front row, uh, so um, um, it'd be good to hear. I'm going to tell this little story, which is uh, lovely <laughs> and... Uh, fascinating and very good for the, for the book, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, because in, in, uh, when, I, when I met uh, Lin Le Hood, uh, the, uh, the, the biographer, and I asked her about who did the painting on, on the, the cover of your book, and she, she, she talked uh, to me about the Chinese. Uh, so I, have, I had the authorization to write with her, that was what I did, and uh, we began to write each other, and, and uh, Janice made uh, several paintings of Minnie Dean in the, in the uh, 70s, uh, maybe. From 68 onwards. Yes, exactly. And uh, we began to write uh, to each other, and uh, I didn't know that she was native from Winton, <laughs> like uh, Minnie Dean. Uh, so uh, before the lockdown, before all this, uh, this crazy nightmare, we decided to, uh, to, to we planned to go to uh, to, uh, to Winton and uh, to Invercargill, sort of mini-dean uh, uh, trip. 
uh, really well organized by Janice, and uh, suddenly, okay, you know the, you know the, you know the what's happening. It was not no longer possible to do anything. So uh, recently, we did it. We did did it for the first time. <laughs> exactly what as we wanted to to to, um, to uh, as we planning to, to to do it. So uh, Janice, could you just. Uh, Tell about what we did and uh, during these three days because it was very important for me because uh, I was uh, with uh, with Janice. I don't drive. I'm 44 and I still have uh, don't have my uh, driving lesson. Uh, so uh, Janice uh, drove a lot uh, during three days. It was uh, with an incredible energy, showing me everything: uh, the the cemetery, the the place where the house, uh, the mini house, where you're supposed to uh, to to be, etc. etc. And uh, we had a lot of conversation about. Uh, that uh, winter uh, uh, in the in the old times, uh, and uh, just it would be very interesting for people you to maybe to, to tell about this uh, this experience. We probably don't have time to hear too much in detail. <laughs> well, I suppose, I suppose insight, I suppose, a glimpse yeah, into yeah, that wonderful well, trip. Yes, yeah. and just as a, just as a little beginning, as as people do give their whaka papa as to where they've come from and and uh, you know what happens. I am a child of Winton. I first heard about Minnie Dean when I was six years old. Um, my great uncle and aunt owned the land after the Deans, and I went to play with the cousins, and the and they found some bones in one of the paddocks, and they said to me, "These are Minnie Dean's baby's bones," <laughs> but wouldn't tell me the rest of the story. The little power play, as it might be, between cousins. So at the age of six, I got on my little bicycle and rode home the two kilometres and said to my mother, who's Minnie Dean? And my mother, who was a bit stern, said, that's enough of that around here, thank you. <laughs> so, so I knew that she came into the, into the category of sex, religion and politics. She was, she was not up for discussion. So um, obviously, when I did hear the story, I wasn't much affected by trauma. I was not a child raised on fairy stories, so I didn't have a bunch of, um, of um, ogres. Timing, which Timing, is probably, yeah. Yeah. sadly, because right. your stories aren't... No. Like so I will write it. So <laughs> anyway, that was father's yeah. side of the family. On mother's side of the family, she was a waitress in Gore, and her employer was Minnie Dean's other daughter, not the one who went down the well mm -hmm. together. So there we yeah. were. Anyway, so we had this great trip, especially on the first day, and when Armory talks about the, um, the energy of it all, well, believe me, I was in bed by half past seven that night <laughs> and got up to clean my teeth at one. Um, and, but anyway, uh, we followed on Minnie's that important journey, sort of in a triangle of Southland. We went down to Bluff and then back to Invercargill, up to Winton, to the cemetery. We went to the Larches, where of course my relatives had lived, but there were new people there, but they were very welcoming, and this is where we looked for the house. Sorry, like Janice, that. so these are all the places where she'd lived? Yes, yeah. where she'd lived. Then we went up to Dipton, because um, the little 11-month-old uh, baby had died on the train between Dipton and Lumsden. Then we went to Lumsden, and Lumsden in recent times, the Historical Society or something, have pulled two engines out of the river, and they are engines that had been on the line when Minnie Dean was, uh, was on the train. So there's very little of Minnie Dean left, but I mean, if you're going to listen to all those stories, she's absolutely present. She's been a thread running through my life, but boy, does she run you, through something. Um, victim or villain for you then? Uh, well, Great Aunt Mary put flowers on her, she knew Minnie Dean, and she put flowers on her grave for 50 years plus. And uh, I think that might have been an indication how some people felt about her, those who knew her. So I, I too keep yeah. sort of an open mind. I think there was carelessness, there was the laudanum overdose, and, and I think, like the rest of us, she was a complex person. I don't think it's easy to give her one label in that. 
and she keeps on. She's like, you know, the earthquakes and the tectonic plates, it's still being constructed. <laughs> Everywhere we went in Southland, we had everybody else's opinion of, um, of, of what Minnie Dean, what everybody else had missed, and so-and-so didn't know the story. The woman at the Ripperton Museum, who called herself the researcher, produced the hat box much too small for a baby, let alone for an 11-month-old child. And I said... So-called. So-called and so-called researcher, because I thought, God forbid... Sorry about that. No one from Riverton here. I thought, I thought, God forbid, if this is the quality of the research. But um, anyway, she, uh, she said, when I said, well, you couldn't get two babies into that, and of course, every second house in, in Southland had the Minnie Dean hat box, you know, and we all had the Minnie Dean hat boxes. And, um, and she said, oh, I don't believe that. And I said, what, don't you believe? And she said, the babies were never in hat boxes. And I thought, wow, this is easy research, because if it doesn't agree with your idea, um, um, forget it. So there were all sorts of interesting people. There was the man up on his roof in a little place called Cozy Nook, um, and he hasn't yet written the story. Crazy nooks in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he hasn't written the story, but um, he knows that some people missed the right information. And he's going to be <laughs> writing a book, you might want to know. Um, and it's going to be called um, Southland Secrets. Yes. Southland <laughs> Secrets. Can't wait. He's also written a very long poem that he has. Uh, wrapped to to music, and for some reason he thinks I'm going to illustrate it. Well, I might have an idea about that. But Janice, that's it amazing. Was I think wonderful, you like gorgeous stories. I'm I going to write the book too. So <laughs> I just in case. Oh my God. <laughs> too many books on reading. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Such great stories, isn't it? Well, thank you, Janice. Um, I worry just um, we've got four minutes, um, and I, uh, uh, people may have some questions, but I just for you then. Going down there, was it what you thought it would be like? Is it how you'd imagined? Because like, you thought you wouldn't get down there, and you thought you were going to have to imagine going to Wyndham and Invercargill, which would be quite hard to do, I think. <laughs> yes. he, asked, he asked me to write the journey. Oh, yes. no. During the lockdown, yeah. in case we so could I not do it. The <laughs> pretend well, well, journey. So, what did you think when you got there? The, uh, it was very strange, uh, in a uh, very strange place. Uh, in Invercargill, I was the only one uh, customer in the hotel. Uh, uh, at this time, it was uh, no, it was very, very strange. Uh, to be honest, uh, Invercargill is not the, the place I will. Uh, <laughs> I, I should. I will give is uh, happiness. Ah uh, yes, and uh, <laughs> I didn't know that the Rolling Stone made a concert uh, in Invercargill in '65 and. Uh, <laughs> In, in the Mick Jagger said it was the hustle of the world, <laughs> and uh, why not? And, uh, and I don't quite understand what he's saying. Is there anyone from Invercargill yes. here? Yes. Oh my God! Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. You, you can say all you like. And last it. thing on, about Invercargill, yesterday I was talking to a Kiwi friend about Invercargill, and she said, oh, it's a, it's a real place to die. And, uh, <laughs> but she didn't really know the story. But it was very amazing because in the hotel I was in front of the place where they were before the the ball, the, the jail. Uh, so it was a very. I was always in this same uh, decor. Uh, Ambience. Ambience, Ambience, yes. Yeah. So, so, so did, it, in, did it help with your understanding of many? Yes, to, to yeah. feel things maybe, but there is no longer. Th and there is nothing, mm. but uh, just little traces from uh, from uh, from the past, and that way that we, what we were uh, searching, um, but mm. it was important because during this uh, this trip, we, it, it was about minute, but we saw also some very beautiful places, mm. and that will take part of my uh, of my uh, of my my story too because. <laughs> we, my book will be about meeting, but but all the all the, all the meeting the the story has uh, generated. Yes. In this, so the good the good uh, news history. and the bad news, and the yes. good and the bad of New Zealand. Like yes, of course. Yeah. Good, good to hear. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is going to be published in France, your book, and yes. your publisher has been receiving the chapters one by one exactly. as exactly. you've been she's, writing them. And she's uh, she's still okay at the ninth yeah. <laughs> chapter, so. So uh, I think I will uh, finish it, I hope so, this summer, and uh, it might be uh, published in January. 
Wow, that's incredible. And hopefully we'll see it, we'd like to see it here. So again, watch this space. Yeah, yeah. We do need some questions, though. So, yes. You've mentioned Minnie Dean's husband several times. What was his involvement, if any? Uh, good question. Um, he he was became bankrupt early, yeah. early on. Um, and... Bankrupts can't then own, or couldn't, I'm not sure what the situation is now, but they couldn't then um, hold, hold money and, and uh, property and things like that. But shortly after that, um, the Women's Protection Act came in, which did enable women to actually own property and, and income. And so she took over Earn it. She had the responsibility of earning money for caring he for was, the family. He was charged for the initially, wasn't he, with her? Oh, initially, the the initially, mm. but he didn't um, participate in caring for the children. He wasn't really involved in them. He worked away on other people's farms and uh, was sometimes gone for days, weeks at a time. Um, he was a drunkard. Um, what money he got, he drank, and um, yeah, so he was not really involved with the children. Oh. Any any more questions? Ah, the man from Invercargill. <laughs> Go on, stand up. The Tully Rolling Stones might have said that, but John Cleese actually said he loved Invercargill. He thought that Palmerston North was the <laughs> 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 uh, I learned about Minnie Dean when I was at high school, or even uh, primary school, or something like that. My impression was that uh, he, she was called a baby farmer, and the, infer the, the inference from that was that she was certainly. Uh, uh, guilty of what she had done and certainly that's the image that I grew up with without much knowledge about actually what was going on. So and I suspect that many people in Vicargo at that time, I'm talking about the 1950s when I was at primary school and early 60s at high school, that would have been I think the, the majority opinion would have been uh, that would have been the case. Mm -hmm. Before Lindley Hood's book came out and what you guys have done um, obviously sh shows a much more d uh, diffuse light on the whole story. Mm -hmm. So I'll be intrigued. I've read Lenny Hood's book, so I'll be intrigued to read uh, both thank your you. contributions as well. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, I think that's so. And yeah. actually now in schools and in high schools mm -hmm. when local history comes up, uh, she is being regarded as relatively innocent. I mean, I don't yes. know quite the word they use, yeah. but they certainly don't think that it was a deliberate. That's not what is being taught now. But mm. she was the person in Winton who haunted Winton childhoods. If you didn't eat your dinner, you, Minnie Dean would get you. Not in my family. I was always threatened with the policeman, but I liked the policeman. Yeah, there we go. Even, even at, at the time of her trial, the prosecution could find no motive. Yeah. So, um, yeah. there you go. Did you have a question? Well, a small point. Um, I was interested to hear that an executed person is buried in a cemetery uh, mm. because I thought I'd heard that suicide. She was in an unmarked uh, uh, in the beginning. She was the UK tenants are better than me in English. Go ahead. Oh, well, um, my understanding is that uh, her body was given to her husband and he took her to. Can't remember. Well, to Winton. She was in. Yes, yes. Took yes. her back to Winton. In the and in Marker. Yeah. Uh, there, there were various. Like a room, cemetery. No, 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 no. Winton. No, we visited. In the, yeah. We visited in the, the grave, historic of course, uh, while we were down there. Yeah. cemetery. Yes. Yeah. Um, the story was, some people said that the railway people wouldn't take her mm. up the line to Winton, but as far as I know, the real story is that she was put on the train uh, to, from Invercargill to Winton, and he picked her up at the Winton railway station. And every family, there's three pubs in Winton, and there still are, and each family in Winton, depending on where their men folk drink, mm -hmm. claimed that he stopped at that particular pub to have a drink just to strengthen his backbone. Um, my family, who weren't actually drinkers, but they lived opposite the top pub, so the top pub was where he stopped. But she is buried in the proper cemetery. 
Cemetery, it was always said that she was buried outside the consecrated ground, but that is not actually so. Um, so she actually is in the cemetery. She was in an unmarked grave, and just across the fence is the farmland of the Larches. So she was practically home again, if you could call that home. Oh, thank you for that. I think we're going to have to wrap it up, but the authors will be here afterwards to chat a bit until they get too hungry and have to eat something for lunch. Um, Karen can sign her books if you'd like to buy a copy. They're $25 so fair from, a, you know, booksellers like selling books, and there they are, so do feel free. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you um, very much. <laughs> for taking part in the discussion too, you know, and people in the audience and um, uh, particularly to Shan for reading, thank you. Um, and thank, thank you for you, coming, yeah. Janice, and joining us. Um, um, very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> Amori, thank you for you coming to New Zealand, I guess, for uh, being interested enough to come to New Zealand. Fantastic and, experience. Yeah, and to want to discover something different about it. Um, I'm really looking forward to your book. Um, I'd be very interested in doing a translation of it, she says randomly, but I got some funding. Yes. Oh, but, uh, oh, there we go. Sure, we're on our way. We're on our way. And there's all these other books coming it's out. It's a virtual book for the <laughs> All these books about Minnie Dean, wonderful. Speaking of which, there's Karen's book, and um, wonderful to have you up from Christchurch breaking thank out you. back into the world again. Yes, thank it's you, wonderful. <laughs> um, and thanks everyone for coming for having so we can have a real event with real people, real people. <laughs> so finish again thanking Kate Fortune, who's been amazing getting it up and running, really. I just thought, whoa, whoa is this going to happen? Um, so yes, from the friends of the Turnbull. Oh, and we didn't get round to that, but the archives were used by both yeah. authors, <laughs> which has been very important in writing this story. So thank you, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.